My name is Brent Carbajal. I'm the Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. And uh, we sponsor this series of lectures. Uh, we, do, we try to do one of them uh, every academic quarter. We're very pleased to see many people here from, from the community and some from the university and probably some of Professor Vita's students and colleagues. So welcome, welcome to all of you. Um, this is a uh, series of lectures that, that is sponsored from uh, a fund uh, that we have in the college called the Dean's Fund for Excellence. Uh, that fund helps us uh, support a number of things that we wouldn't be able to support otherwise. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that through that funding, through, our, uh, for, through the gracious contributions of our donors, through the support of the city, uh, the use of this facility, um, and, uh, and TV, we're really, really pleased to, to do this. So again, welcome. I think we're going to have a very interesting talk. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our speaker, and I'm, I'm doing this very informally because I know him quite well. This is Professor Ed Vida. He is the director of the linguistics program at Western Washington University. He is a professor of Russian in the Department of Modern and Classical Languages. Um, professor Vida uh, took his PhD in Slavic linguistics uh, from the University of Washington. Uh, uh, thankfully came here, has been here since 1987. Uh, has been an excellent colleague and, and, uh, and faculty member. And I wanted to say a, a few things about just uh, his, his experience because tonight we're going to hear uh, a kind of a different side of, of Ed's experience. But, but in terms of academics and, and scholarship and teaching, I just want to say Ed is perhaps, and I'm not absolutely sure of this, but he is perhaps the only faculty member at Western Washington University uh, who has won both the prestigious Elitch Teaching Award uh, and the Olskamp Research Award. Uh, <laughs> Professor Vida uh, is world known um, for his scholarship uh, on linguistics. He has published, um, I believe, five books, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 uh, refereed articles, literally hundreds of reviews, uh, presentations. This is a man who is constantly inquiring, constantly studying, constantly writing, constantly speaking in a good way. And um, we are just really thrilled to, to, to have him. So I'm not going to say much more. Uh, you know what the topic of the talk is. There's the title. Um, I'll just... Uh, Thank Professor Vida for, for being willing to, to talk with us this evening. Um, sit back and enjoy, and, and uh, remember that we'll have some, some time for questions afterwards. So thank you. Thank you, Brent. And thank you for coming tonight. The topic I'm going to speak on is actually one of the most important events that happened in the 20th century. It's also still the worst environmental catastrophe that's befallen the um, Earth um, in the time of mankind. And it is also, unfortunately, one that is often forgotten since it has dropped out of the headlines almost a quarter of a century ago. Um, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster happened on the border of what is today independent countries of, of uh, Ukraine and Belarus. Um, and it, it, you can see that on the map. Uh, it, it released several hundred times the amount of, uh, of uh, radiation that was released by the Hiroshima atomic blast. And it had political repercussions that I will argue that was important for the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. It, it also had repercussions um, in, um, in my own life, which I'll tell you about as, as we go along, because I am not really a, a qualified historian nor a specialist on nuclear energy or on the environment. Or, uh, most of the things that I'll be talking about, I am not a, 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 a specialist in. I'm a linguist who studies languages of Eurasia. But my uh, story happened to connect with Chernobyl as it occurred. I was in Moscow at the time, and I actually wound up being in the office of CBS News helping cover the story during the time that it was happening for reasons that I'll explain as we go along. So from an outsider's perspective, I have an unusual uh, um, uh, uh, perspective on the, uh, on the events that happened during um, April 1986 and early May in 1986. Uh, what is not generally known and what was not discovered and revealed until um, quite a bit after the Soviet Union collapsed 
was that as bad as Chernobyl was, it could have been much, much worse. There was a danger in the weeks after the original explosion of an even greater explosion uh, to follow, which was averted by heroic uh, self-sacrificing moves by the Soviet uh, authorities and, uh, and by hundreds of thousands of people who, who uh, prevented this uh, second explosion from happening. And, and uh, I'll tell you about that uh, also. Um, the entire story starts in, deep in the Cold War, and in fact, um, I myself am a child of the Cold War, like very many of you who are in the audience, uh, a, a world that was divided into the, the East and the West uh, with constant fear of uh, possible warfare, though neither side at all wanted a war, and in fact, it never occurred. Um, everything that happened, however, was twisted into this framework of right or wrong, good and bad, ours and theirs, and this is something that uh, I I uh, knew from uh, early childhood, uh, my own family background is partly from Eastern Europe. That interested me in languages of Eastern Europe, and I became interested particularly in Russian because I was interested in bridging that gap that seemed to exist between the East and the West, it seemed to exist between English speakers and speakers of Russian. Very few Americans at that time, in, in the um, 1970s, early 1980s, were really fluent in Russian, and I wanted to become one of them. Um, in, and so, uh, in 1980, very beginning of 1980, I went for an entire half a year and spent all winter in the city of St. Petersburg, which was then called Leningrad, as a student, and I didn't speak any English when I was there. I basically, by the time I was done, uh, was so fluent in Russian that uh, people mistook me as a native speaker. Um, that, uh, that was also right after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. The Soviet Union had sent hundreds of thousands of troops into Afghanistan, and one of the things that struck me in the early months of that war was uh, one incident where a, um, a Soviet soldier defected to the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan. And no one in the U.S. Embassy could speak any Russian. And no one could communicate with that person until someone was flown in. And I thought, this is not a good situation. And I wanted to, to, to be able to, to speak uh, with, uh, with people who know, knew both English and, and Russian. So I learned Russian in this uh, very cold environment, and, uh, not baptism by fire, but maybe by ice. And, um, and then in the 1980s, I was a student at the University of Washington. I taught full time as a, as a graduate student TA and, and earned my way through the master's and PhD. But I also led tours every chance I got for travel agencies as well as the University of Washington to not only Moscow and Leningrad, but to all sorts of other areas of the Soviet Union at that time. And I, I came to learn a great deal about the country and about the people during these trips. And my big trip uh, was the year before I finished my uh, degree, my, I was writing my dissertation, I got a scholarship that enabled me to spend almost a year in uh, Moscow. And this was just as the transition was occurring to the new Gorbachev regime. And uh, we, no one knew exactly what to expect from that regime. I lived in Moscow State University building. That little star is, a, is much larger than my room actually was at that time, the 604 Zone D. It was a very cozy room. Uh, and um, I spent a lot of time working on uh, languages of, uh, of Russian language and also other languages of Eurasia. Asia. I won't go into the details of that because I might lose my audience if I do. Um, but that is what I was doing in 1985 and 86. Because uh, I was part of a, a group of American students, uh, probably about 10 or 12 of us, and they elected me group leader, which meant that I, because of my Russian language skills, you know, it meant I was a liaison with the uh, administration of Moscow State University, but also with the archival administration upon which many of the members of my group depended for research materials. And my my research was not threatening to the Soviet authorities. No one cared about conjugating verbs. But if you were studying dissident writers or some other political topics, uh, it was very difficult to get information. And I have a naturally diplomatic um, personality, and I was able to get something for everybody in the group uh, by working uh, together with the Soviet authorities. 
Um, I also um, often visited the U.S. Embassy, which is on Tchaikovsky Street, an uh, old U.S. Embassy uh, with, uh, in, in Moscow. And I was the liaison from the embassy because I was group leader. I had the only telephone in my room, and I often uh, got calls from the U.S. Embassy with questions. Um, as I would also go there for lunch because it was the best fast food in Moscow at the time. Uh, there was no McDonald's or anything else. And so I got a chance to meet and become part of a group of journalists. Um, I was introduced to the son of the uh, um, then uh, editor of the New York Times, um, Andy Rosenthal, who worked together with one of my former students from the University of Washington, uh, Carol Williams, and I often had lunch uh, during busy schedule with, uh, with journalists. And as a result of that, I was uh, contacted by CBS News during 1985 and 86 and interviewed on a number of occasions, a few of which went on the national US TV having to do with Soviet life. Um, the reason why uh, news media uh, organizations like CBS had to stoop to talking to linguistics graduate students to find out things about the Soviet Union was that the Soviet system, ever since Stalin had consolidated his power in late 1920s, was based on secrecy and control of information. And many things had occurred in the country that had not become public knowledge to the population or to the world at large. Even natural disasters like earthquakes were never reported in the newspapers at all um, during the Soviet period. And uh, there had, up to this point, been 13 major nuclear accidents and numerous minor accidents in the country. None of them made their way into the press or re were re officially admitted to. Uh, the worst one happened in 1957-58 when improperly stored nuclear waste material um, exploded and uh, spread across the countryside. 40 square miles of the area near Kushtim in western Siberia is still uninhabitable today. and You can't even go through the, the area without endangering your life. None of that was in my mind towards the end of my stay in April 1986. I was um, finishing my dissertation research. I was also in the most interesting and enjoyable part of it. I was down in the Caucasus mountain region in the Republic of Georgia, which is famous for it having produced his most famous son, Joseph Stalin. I was there uh, learning Georgian, studying at the University of Tbilisi, uh, um, and I was with uh, my colleague. Um, Kevin Tuit, who uh, went on to become a world famous specialist in Georgian language and Caucasus studies. He's at the University of Montreal now. He's my roommate. And uh, this was an extremely enjoyable period of time. Um, I was able to learn Georgian quite well. Uh, it has 33 uh, letter alphabet, completely different than Russian, um, and, and very, very different language, culture, and heritage entirely. And I was finishing up my stay in Georgia and traveling back to Moscow on April 26th, uh, Friday, April 26th, uh, 1986. And um, I, I was bringing back two prized bottles of Georgian wine, the best wine in the Soviet Union, which was hard to get even in Moscow. And I had little, I had no knowledge whatsoever, like almost no one else in the world, that about 800 miles to the west of where I was traveling, uh, the, uh, the world had just experienced its worst ever nuclear disaster. And the disaster, as I mentioned earlier, occurred on the border of Ukraine and Belarus. It was um, in a nuclear power plant that had just been in operation a couple of years. Um, and the op uh, nuclear power plant is always called the Chernobyl reactor, Chernobyl nuclear power plant. But Chernobyl is a town located close by. The actual name of the power plant and the reactor that blew up was uh, the Vladimir Lenin a nuclear power plant, but it's never referred to that way. And this was a huge nuclear complex of four units. It was the fourth unit that exploded in the morning, April 26th, 1.23 a.m. And this actually was a very prestigious place to live and work if you were a Soviet citizen. Uh, nuclear physicists were a prestigious class. Everybody who lived in the, in the town of Pripyat, all 45 to 50,000 of the residents, were family members or workers of the Chernobyl nuclear complex. And they had special privileges, special stores, where they had goods that were not readily available in other parts of the Soviet Union. So this was a, 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 an elite area and an elite group of people that were um, in the vicinity of the reactor.
Now, I am no nuclear physicist, but very superficially I can explain that the Chernobyl nuclear reactor number four, uh, it had 1,661 uranium rods. There were also 211 boron control rods that could be raised between the um, uranium rods to slow up, uh, uh, slow down the reaction um, uh, uh, that was producing electricity uh, by uh, heating water into steam and uh, having the turbines uh, turned. So this was a huge amount of electricity produced by this nuclear reaction. Um, now, ironically, um, there was a safety test that was being conducted early in the wee hours of that morning that led to the catastrophe. And the safety test being conducted had to do with trying to find a way to shorten the time needed if there was a shortage of electricity to run the, um, the, the turbines that would get the water moving through the reactor. There is a backup diesel pumps, but there was about 57 second lag time between the time one would kick in and the other would, uh, uh, one would stop and the other would kick in. And that was deemed unacceptable and tests were mandated by the Soviet Union in order to try to shorten that gap. And these tests and the fear of uh, this catastrophic shortage of energy that would cripple nuclear plants actually came about during 1981 when the Israeli Air Force destroyed Saddam Hussein's nuclear reactor in Iraq and it set off a great deal of fear in the Soviet Union that NATO or some other force might uh, also in, in some similar way compromise uh, uh, electricity or the uh, nuclear power plants uh, like Chernobyl. So these tests were mandated. Tests should have been conducted before the power plant was even online, but like many things in the Soviet Union, there was a rush to get things completed during a, a time of frame of a plan that had been set forth by the central government. Uh, the uh, senior party official who oversaw the building of the reactor, Viktor Brikhanov, had received awards because he was able to finish the uh, job on time, but the only reason that he was able to do this is because he used substandard materials. The roof was supposed to be made of in of materials that wouldn't burn and there was no such materials available so he managed to get some materials that would do but they actually turned out to be uh, catch on fire in in this catastrophe the uh, other official that was in charge of the uh, plant um, Nikolai Fomin who lived in Pripyat he was actually a very senior party member who was in this uh, in charge of the plant because of his party status he had not had nuclear training he was actually an engineer that knew more about hydroelectric plants he was the one who ordered the safety test. Now, uh, there was one thing that really was uh, at the heart of this catastrophe, and that is in the nuclear um, uh, system in the Soviet Union, things were even kept secret from nuclear scientists themselves and many people in the nuclear industry. And during the 1970s, it had been discovered already that there was a design flaw that made a certain aspect of the running of this kind of nuclear power plant dangerous, and that is that the boron control rods were tipped with uh, a, a graph graphite at the very ends of them, and the graphite was fine if the boron rods were actually in the reactor water itself, but if they were completely removed and had to be reinserted, the graphite upon reinsertion into the water, even though you're putting in the boron rods to slow down the reaction and cool off the reactor, for a very small moment of time produces a huge surge of energy. So if the boron rods are completely out of the reactor and the reactor is at very low um, the speeds and they have to be put back in, it can create a, a, a potential for, for a, a steam explosion. The people that were at the plant, inside the plant for the night shift, beginning on, on, on 12 a.m. Um, uh, in um, April uh, 26, did not know this about the nuclear power plant, and even though they were important uh, people at the plant. Um, the shift foreman, Alexander Kimov, was usually in charge, but today he had above him Anatoly Dyatlov, who was a, an important senior nuclear engineer who came from Siberia. He had a, a, a record, distinguished record, uh, uh, but also some nuclear accidents that had occurred on his watch that were not deemed to be his fault. 
he outranked Akimov in the, um, in the control room, and it was he who was really pushing for this test to be conducted uh, no matter what, because he was going to get a promotion um, if this uh, was able to be done. And so Jatlov and uh, Akimov began to argue about exactly how much uh, kilowatts of energy the plant should be reduced to in order for the safety test to begin. Uh, the so specification said from 700 to 1,000, uh, but uh, Jatlov wanted to do it as, as low as 200, and he, he got his way. Unfortunately, by 12.28 a.m., because of um, uh, an accident, uh, the, uh, the uh, reactor output was reduced almost to nothing. Uh, even lower than what Dyatlov had wanted. And as a result of that, Dyatlov gave the order in order to start up the reactor a little bit more to get up to the, even the low uh, amount that he wanted. He had made the fateful decision to completely remove the boron rods with their graphite tips from the reactor, which meant that there was actually no control that was actually in the reactor at the time. Now, Safety alarms, some of the alarms, some of the safety equipment had been disabled, um, others were not, but to, when they began going off, it was because uh, the, the steam level, even with a, a low amount uh, that, uh, of, of operation of the reactor, uh, began to cause a, a serious threat. Steam began to build up in the reactor. And for a while, uh, nothing was done about this, uh, but at, in 119, they decided because of this uh, increased uh, level of steam, that the the sensors were showing that there should be water, much more water to put back into the reactor. But when the water flow was put back into the reactor, because the reactor was even more overheated already than the sensors indicated, it produced an even greater amount of steam and even greater amount of pressure. One of the technicians in the Chernobyl plant was walking past the pile of, uh, of the reactor and um, saw that the 350 kilogram safety caps, this is a, a kind of a reenactment of them that are, uh, were atop uh, the uranium rods were actually bouncing uh, a feet, several feet up into the air because of the steam pressure that was already built up in the reactor. And he ran with breakneck speed to the control room. There's no cell phones at that time. And he, to warn them that they, they, this was going on, this had never occurred ever before. Um, and at 1.23 a.m., the fateful decision was made because of what looked like a, a, a runaway uh, surge of steam in the reactor to put those uh, boron control rods in the reactor. It's like you see the light getting too bright. You want to turn the off switch off. When you turn the off switch off, you expect the light to go out. But suppose you have an off switch that actually increases the amount of light by 100% for a few seconds before it turns the light off. That's exactly what this reactor was. And so when the boron rods were put back into the reactor, the graphite tips reacted with the, uh, the water, and there was a momentary surge of energy into the already overheated like a steam kettle with almost no water in it reactor, and it caused an explosion that disabled the ability of those boron safety rods to get farther down into the reactor. And as a result of that, within a second, there was an explosion that ripped up, open the core of the reactor. Uh, it threw the 1,000 a uh, um, ton uh, uh, cover of the reactor hundreds of feet into the air and off of, to the side, and the worst nuclear uh, disaster of history has just occurred. And it, when this explosion occurred, over a hundred times the amount of uh, radiation released by the Chernobyl, by the Hiroshima blast was immediately hurled into the atmosphere. This was just the beginning of the radiation uh, dispersal. And every hour after that, something like 30,000 uh, um, radioactive units, which is called Rentgens, were spewing out into the atmosphere because the graphite inside of the reactor being exposed to air caught fire and burned, burned so hot that it actually melted the uh, metallic out, uh, parts of the inside of the reactor and it produced enormous amount of heat, enormous amount of radioactive particles are going actually thousands of feet into the air and contaminating the clouds that are above the reactor. And uh, to give a perspective, uh, it is thought that if every year a person has up to two of these uh, units exposure, it is not any kind of uh, danger of their health. If you get 400 of these units, it is, uh, uh, it is considered the lethal dose that will kill you. But look how much is coming at every, every hour out of this reactor, uncontrolled. Um, I should mention,
that the, whoever took this photograph and some also footage that was inside of the plant, this is uh, released from KGB archives long after the collapse of the Soviet Union, must have received such a massive dose of radiation that they couldn't possibly have survived more than two weeks after taking these pictures. The first journalists that were on the scene, uh, Igor Kostin, uh, who's become famous as a, as a, as a chronicler of Chernobyl, uh, not only at the time but afterwards, um, he, uh, from a helicopter, took with a telephoto lens fo this photograph that you see and several others. But even though he was very far away from the reactor, the radiation was so intense that it destroyed his camera after about 12 photographs. And as you can see, it was developing the film when he was taking it. He was, got out of there uh, and didn't stay and didn't get close to, enough closer to the reactor. Now, unfortunately, during the night, uh, a, a fire brigade had been called, and they did not know what type of fire had occurred. The roof of the reactor was burning, and they spent hours trying to put this unusual fire out, pouring tons of water on it that did no good whatsoever. Most of these people became very ill with radiation poisoning. Two of them died that night, and the, uh, the fatalities uh, followed afterwards. Uh, the only people who actually saw the explosion, there were two fishermen who were uh, there, and they also watched it all night like some kind of huge fireworks display until towards the early morning they became violently ill, and uh, uh, they also um, in the next few weeks died of radiation exposure. But the firemen didn't have any equipment on or any protective gear like the ones that you see here later on trying to, trying to clean things up. Now, of course, the news of this explosion came to the um, Fomin, the, uh, the director, and also Buchanov, who is the architect of the plant, and he, uh, uh, he asked how much uh, radiation was being uh, released uh, there, and, and the radiation uh, counters only went up to, to 500. It was actually thousands and thousands of, of this that was uh, being released. And he said that this was not that dangerous, that it could be contained. Um, he talked to Gorbachev off on the phone and uh, said that the reactor was safe, there'd been some small accident, not really even an explosion, and that the reactor, in fact, was safe enough, just like Russian samovar, you could put it on Red Square. So Gorbachev does not receive any information um, about the severity of what has actually occurred. And in fact, these men themselves didn't quite understand, because this accident completely dwarfed anything that had ever happened before. Uh, the 50,000 residents of Pripyat, some rumors started circulating that uh, an accident had happened during the night. No information was given to them. Uh, there was an enormous amount of radiation that was going uh, into the city at this time. The population was completely uninformed and unprotected. Um, the uh, radiation also travels uh, across uh, Europe and it gets so high within two days that in Sweden nuclear s physicists think they have had an accident at their own reactor and they shut it down. And reports start coming into Gorbachev from abroad that, uh, that there must have been some kind of nuclear accident asking what has happened. Uh, Gorbachev received no information that there was a severe accident uh, and he he was afraid that the Western propaganda would use a small incident in order to blow it up into something that uh, was um, embarrassing. Um, there was a few unofficial news media reports uh, based, on, uh, based on hearsay that was incorrect that there had been a severe, enormous like, nuclear explosion there, that 2,000 to 4,000 people had been killed by it. That, of course, wasn't true, but this uh, in, uh, irritated the upper Soviet government. Um, in fact, however, there is so much radiation that we're spewing out of the reactor, most of it going to northern and western Europe, not to Moscow during these first uh, few days, that reports continued to stream into the Soviet Union um, asking what had happened. Um, Gorbachev demands more information from the local authorities who are not giving the information that they even that one, the information that they have, and he actually has to ask the KGB in the West to monitor what western scientists are saying about the levels of radiation. 
He also sets up a commission and sends people to the site to find out what's really happening during this period of time. The U.S. satellite photo, which you can't really see in this photo, um, uh, shows that there had been a, 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 destru a partial destruction of Unit 4 of the Chernobyl nuclear reactor. So within two days, the United States was aware that this is where the accident had occurred. Um, Gorbachev at this point uh, admits that that uh, in private that this is, uh, had been an accident, but they're still assessing the severity of the accident. And he himself did not know uh, at that time how severe it was. Um, now, because there was this cat and mouse game constantly going on between the Soviet Union and the West, um, uh, uh, the Soviet Union tried to prevent Western uh, authorities of finding out information that they could use for propaganda purposes. And so CBS News um, found itself in a position where its translator simply pretended to be sick and not work. And he took a long May Day holiday and this, one of the world's premier news organizations in the center of Moscow and one of the big stories of the 20th century had no one in their office who could speak any Russian. They couldn't talk to ordinary Russians. They couldn't even understand the Soviet nude broadcasts. And so they, I got a call. They asked me to come to work. And so I did. I thought uh, I was hearing rumors in the dormitory. There were some students who came back uh, on a train that thought they had been irradiated. Uh, people had been listening to BBC, and no one knew anything that was going on. And I thought to myself, well, you know, in the middle of a crisis like this, it's probably good to work in a news organization. You might find out things first. So I agreed and I went and spent most of the next week in the CBS news office and probably in that week I, I slept to about two days worth of sleep during this period of time. And I began to, to um, help uh, set up interviews, um, uh, help uh, translate in, uh, in, uh, uh, with, uh, with Soviet citizens. I tried to find people who had been in uh, Ukraine or in the area who had come back to Moscow. One of my former Russian teachers, Karen Black, had been in Kiev. I wasn't able to get in touch with her. Um, but there were some French students at Moscow State University who had indeed just come back from Kiev, Ukraine, and we managed to get them into the CBS news office, and they, wound up, they were put on national U.S. TV talking about what they had and had not seen, but they hadn't seen anything. They didn't know anything was really wrong in Kiev. Um, this is my boss during that week, who's now a famous journalist in, um, in Washington, D.C. for CBS News, Wyatt Andrews, a fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, newsman even, even then when he was a young man. Um, I worked very closely with him as his personal translator during all of this period of time, and I also began to monitor the Soviet news broadcast and, um, and, uh, and tell him what was actually being said by the Soviet authorities, which was an important part of the story. Uh, May Day. And in the evening, uh, the Soviet news channel Vrimya normally broadcasts in this important communist holiday, the International Workers' Day, big uh, displays of Red Square Moscow May Day Parade and the um, Palace Square Leningrad May Day Parade. That was always what was on TV in that evening. But as I watched Vremya that evening, I was amazed to see that Moscow wasn't shown, St. Leningrad wasn't shown. Instead, all of the towns and cities in the immediate vicinity of Chernobyl, all their May Day parades were being shown on TV. All of these hundreds of thousands of people were out in the open in all of the small towns and everyone who was watching this broadcast across the Soviet Union could see for themselves that all of these places near Chernobyl were perfectly fine. There was no explosion, there was nothing wrong. Nothing was said on the news about Chernobyl but the message to the population was clear. Everything is fine. Unfortunately it wasn't. There was an enormous amount of radiation coming out of the sky. The, the winds and, had shifted and in fact a huge amount of radiation fell on those May Day parades in Kiev. I myself was fooled into thinking that this might not be as big of a, a, a story as what we were thinking because uh, the uh, May Day parade in Kiev even had Shubitsky, the first secretary of the Ukrainian Communist Party, there with his grandchildren in the parade. Uh, but in fact, all of these people were getting uh, uh, radiation on top of them, untold amounts. They themselves did not really understand possibly the risks that was happening at this time. Um, how, uh, now, uh, since that time, however, uh, w those news photo videos of the parades have all disappeared from Soviet archives. They were destroyed. And the first secretary of the Ukrainian party committed suicide later uh, uh, after this happened. Now, Gorbachev 
uh, finally sent one of the world's top nuclear specialists, a high-ranking party member, academician, uh, Valery Ligasov. He had sent him to uh, Pripyat to live there, to, to monitor, and to give direct reports to him exactly what was happening. And when Ligasov got there, when he began to take readings, he was astounded at what he found. He just couldn't believe the radiation levels were 60,000 times normal in areas even a, a mile away from the plant. Um, and it was extremely dangerous. The people who are living in this town had already received two days worth of this, uh, this level of, uh, of, uh, of uh, radiation. And if they'd stayed there a day and a half longer, they would have all died. And so Legasov immediately realized how severe this was, even though he didn't quite understand what was causing this amount of radiation to continue to be released. He ordered the evacuation of the whole region. He forced everyone to leave. The people were uh, given two hours notice to get on buses. They were told that this was a temporary evacuation just for prophylactic. But they, in fact, were never allowed to return. They were not allowed to take hardly any of their belongings. And once they, uh, w there were videos of this evacuation, and there was so much radiation in the air at the time that it was exposing the film, and the film has what looks like fireflies in it because of the radiation. These people are already dangerously contaminated. No study has been done to show the long-term effects of their health after they left. But this was the right decision to take, and it should have been taken a lot earlier. The people were entirely entirely evacuated from what came to be called the exclusion zone. Legasov and his people stayed in this zone, even though it was highly dangerous. They stayed behind sealed rooms as much as possible, but they really had to find out what was going on in the Chernobyl plant. They sent in liquidators. In fact, the word in Russian, liquidator, is a word that was invented for people who were brought in to clean up the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. It was not a word that even existed in the language. And eventually over 500,000 of these people, twice the size of Napoleon's army, were going to go through Chernobyl. And all of them are going to be affected uh, with uh, their health, long-term health, in some way uh, by this exposure. Um, the reactor was still burning. Uh, some of the local communist authorities told Legasov that maybe they should just let it burn itself out. And Legasov tried to explain to them that it was releasing every few hours more radiation in the atmosphere than had been re released by all the nuclear tests since the beginning of the Cold War. And so they decided that they had to make very uh, in, uh, in, uh, severe uh, attempt to, to close off this huge amount of radiation that's being exposed into the atmosphere. Um, downwind from Chernobyl, all of the forest turned completely red. It was destroyed by that initial um, wave of blast and heat that had come from the reactor. And it's called the Red Forest. It's the most polluted area in the world today. You can see it in this photograph. Ligasov realized that this had to be uh, contained, that this column of highly radioactive particles had to be sta staunched from the reactor. And he made a decision to drop 6,000 tons of sand mixed with boric acid, which would help uh, uh, slow down the uh, spread of radiation. And, uh, and that was to, uh, to stop this, uh, this rising column of radiation. Um, no one could get anywhere near uh, the, the plant. They had to use uh, hundreds of helicopter crews flown in from all parts of the Soviet Union. Crews were brought in from Afghanistan and flew uh, dozens of missions. The, uh, the temperature, even a few hundred yards above the reactor, was over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It was um, dangerous to be there uh, even for minutes of a time. There was so much radiation, but all of these helicopter crews had to do this in order to staunch the, the huge column, and it began to work. Um, the, the, the sand melted and fused, and a lot of the radiation that was spewing high up into the atmosphere was staunched. Uh, one of the helicopters actually hit into a, a crane and crashed very close to the uh, reactor. All of the, all of the people were killed in that helicopter, and probably, although there's no statistics, most of the people uh, who were in this operation um, had their lives cut short by health uh, health uh, damage that was caused by their exposure to this uh, amount of radiation. The helicopters themselves were so polluted that they had to be left at Chernobyl and never used again. By May the 2nd, um, after May Day, uh, the, uh, the, the, the operation was successful enough that there was no longer an enormous plume of radiation coming out of the plant. It had been partially plugged up.
Um, but it was not possible to get anywhere near the plant. It was astronomical readings of radiation. And Legasov, uh, who is a really high qualified nuclear physicist, um, uh, uh, realized that the temperatures that they were recording in this area must be hot enough to melt the core of the reactor, which was going to melt down, melt down into the concrete underneath of the reactor and below the reactor and underneath of there were enormous amounts of water that had pulled uh, that, uh, from the firemen uh, trying to put the fire out and there were also chambers that had, uh, had water uh, uh, for safety purposes uh, in, in this area. And Legasov realized uh, that, uh, that he had to get the temperature down of this magma before it melted and went down into the water level. And so there's a decision to drop lead, uh, which, uh, which absorbs and reduces the high temperature onto the reactor. And some of this lead goes into the atmosphere, and it's uh, found in people who are victims of this tragedy. But it succeeded in reducing the heat level significantly and helping to seal off the top of the reactor even more. Um, but the uranium and graphite mixture was still too hot. It was still melting. It was melting down towards water chambers. If 1,400 kilograms of this enormous many tons of mass were to meet the water that was pulled just below these uh, concrete layers of Chernobyl, uh, the Soviet scientists, including Legasov, um, believed that it would set off a huge nuclear explosion. Uh, that was three to five megatons that would have vaporized all of the nuclear material that was in the other three intact plants that were next door to the uh, uh, reactor number four. And it was uh, estimated that it would kill immediately the population of Kiev and Minsk, the capitals of Belarus and, um, and, uh, and Ukraine, and make a large portion of, of, of Eastern Europe uninhabitable for, uh, for many human lifetimes. And so a huge effort began to try to get this water out of here, to try to get the temperature down um, in order to stave off this catastrophe. Thousands of trains were ordered to Minsk, to Kiev, to evacuate the population on a moment's notice if necessary. This never was necessary because of the uh, uh, attempts that were successfully made by the Soviets during this period of time. By May the 2nd, Legasov had provided enough information to Gorbachev that he realized how catastrophic the situation was, that it was worse than, than anyone had thought and potentially even worse than that. And he began to provide information to the West. Gorbachev began to provide um, information, the attitude of the entire Soviet government changed. There was even a photograph of Chernobyl with the uh, plume uh, airbrushed out that was put on uh, Soviet TV that e evening um, and admitting that the accident had occurred. Uh, not talking about the severity and the, and, and the dangers, and even the West wasn't, uh, wasn't warned about the uh, actual worst case scenario, but the Soviet government was, um, was at least forthcoming about that. Um, and the severity uh, even becomes known to the, uh, uh, the top uh, officials. People realize they're being irradiated. Um, uh, the iodine pills are, are beginning to be distributed to people, but for many people it's too late. They've absorbed in their thyroid glands very much uh, radioactive iodine-131. Uh, in fact, the people that were in Pripyat, there's so much radioactive iodine in the air that they could actually taste metal in their mouths. Um, and uh, so, so some of these precautions are very late. Uh, the Soviets invite an American specialist from Los Angeles, um, uh, uh, Richard Gale, to uh, Moscow to give bone marrow transplants to some of the first victims of Chernobyl who had been flown to Moscow's hospital number six. These people um, were almost all going to die. Uh, but uh, there was a heroic attempt to save them, um, and uh, the uh, CBS News was running after uh, Richard Gale, trying to get an interview with him when he was going from his hotel to the hospital. I wasn't needed for that because everyone could speak English. And in fact, I wasn't needed for much of anything after that because the Soviet news uh, translator suddenly appeared again when everything changed in uh, on May the 2nd, and I uh, basically was ended uh, my work for CBS at that that time and I went back to being a graduate student.
So uh, that was my one week at CBS. Um, now, for many people uh, uh, in the world, it was thought that the worst of the Soviet nuclear um, uh, accident was being contained, that it was not anymore a great threat. But in fact, for weeks and weeks, uh, it was touch and go whether that second explosion was going to happen. Eventually, over 500,000 liquidators come in. All of them would expose themselves to dangerous levels of radiation. There's been no studies on the long-term effect or even the casualties of, of this huge group of people that many of whom willingly sacrificed their lives uh, for this, uh, this tragedy not to get bigger. For instance, miners were brought in. They excavated a huge area underneath of the Chernobyl nuclear reactor to pour enormous amount of concrete inside of there to make it even harder for that melting mass of radiation to go deeper into uh, in, down. People also uh, went into the uh, water chambers, uh, divers, to open manually some of the um, hatchways to drain this uh, area, and uh, that was successful, but they lost their lives during it. It was extremely important for this concrete to be poured, even though it's really a temporary solution in the long term of things, because if the, even, even after the water had been removed from this immediate area, um, if the radiation continued to go deeper and deeper, there's an enormous aquifer that is quite a bit below Chernobyl that uh, is the main water supply of Moscow and most of the European part of the Soviet Union it would have been permanently polluted and also Black Sea would have. I don't have statistics how much of, if at all, this pollution went into this deeper area, um, but, but the main catastrophe was avoided during this period of time. Ironically, the miners who were deep in this shaft, they had to work very brief periods of time because even under the ground it was dangerous radioactive. It was, it was uh, 130 degrees in, in where they were working. They had, couldn't wear any protective gear. But when they came out of the mine shaft, that was when they really had to run because it was so dangerous levels of radiation that even 10 minutes exposure on the ground would probably kill you. There were pieces of graphite for many hundreds of yards around the plant that were so highly radioactive that if you came in contact with them for even more than a minute, that was a, a death sentence. And, and, uh, and all of this still had to be cleaned up. So the liquidators were, were fitted with lead vests. They were fitted with all sorts of uniforms. And in some of the worst parts of the Chernobyl accident, they weren't able to work for more than a minute a day. They had to run in, do a tiny job, and run out. And what would have taken one man one hour took 60 men one hour. And they're all exposed to very dangerous levels of radiation, even with these kinds of equipments that they had. The worst was on the roof, the roof that had enormous amount of the high, most highly radioactive materials that had been burning. Um, this, uh, there was an attempt to send robotic um, instruments to try to get rid of these chunks of radiation, active material that was on the roof, but the, the radiation was so high that the robotic instruments to, uh, malfunctioned and couldn't work. And they had to send people in to do this, volunteers. And this picture shows actually here, uh, as it is being taken, the radiation is so intense coming up from the roof that it is actually developing the film as the picture is being taken. All of the equipment that these 500,000 liquidators um, used was so polluted that it could never be used again. But within half a year, a crude steel and concrete sarcophagus has been built over the entire plant. Uh, uh, there was um, almost all of the radiation at that point seemed to have been contained um, uh, inside of this huge sarcophagus. It's been estimated that the life of this sarcophagus that was built in 1986 is about uh, 30 years. And then it's dangerous for more radiation to be leaking. But in fact, re measurements that have been taken near the base of this um, sarcophagus are also very, very high radiation even today. And inside the nuclear sarcophagus is still this highly radioactive mass, astronomical readings of radiation that can only be taken by machines. Uh, and uh, this uh, part of it that would have created that huge nuclear explosion, because this was a water chamber, um, has been named the elephant's foot. Pripyat, the huge zone, eventually 130,000 people were 
permanently evacuated from these areas, it has never been uh, repopulated again. It's still a, a dead zone. Um, the people who uh, uh, forced the evacuation also tried to kill all of the animals that was in this zone, including pets that were left behind by the people. And it is still an area that um, is not considered to be livable, although people go into it uh, and, and stay, um, uh, but they have to monitor the radio radiation when they do so. And so here's the Pripyat ghost town. The nature is taking over. There's a, a, some of the vegetation in this area has grown enormously, and in fact, all across Europe after this fir, uh, first year of Chernobyl, there was gro unusual growth of, uh, of vegetation in many areas. Um, and um, everything was abandoned as, at, at that moment as it was left. And this area, in fact, has become one of the most untouched uh, uh, areas for, for nature, even though it has so much radiation in pockets of it that is actually very, very dangerous. You don't know where it is highly radioactive and where it doesn't happen to be radioactive because it just happens where did rain fall from those radioactive clouds above Chernobyl in those first few days. Sometimes it didn't fall right close by. It fell even outside of what is the exclusion zone. So there are highly radioactive areas farther away than this and then there are areas here inside that aren't so radioactive. There is a huge amount of debate over exactly how much radiation came out of the plant, uh, where exactly it went. The prevailing winds took it at first far away from Moscow. They took it to the west. And part, places like northern Scandinavia were the worst polluted. There are reindeer pastures that you still can't use in parts of northern Sweden, Finland. Parts of, um, of southern Bavaria, Germany were polluted. And some of the mushrooms in the forest there still is not healthy to eat. Uh, the li little island of Corsica in the Mediterranean, French uh, part of France, uh, had high levels of, uh, of radiation and had some of the same cancers that later showed up in the area around Chernobyl. So it was really unpredictable where this radiation went. Um, uh, stories started circulating that uh, the name Chernobyl, which is Ukrainian and the Russian name is Chernobyl, of the same, is an ancient name for this region that was 1,000 years old. It means wormwood, which is a plant, Artemisia in Latin, that grows in this general vicinity. People noticed that in the revelation of the Bible, there was the, the prophecy of the star named Wormwood that destroyed all of the, uh, the, the, uh, so much of the regions. And many people made the connection with uh, Chernobyl. Um, the unofficial death toll. 25 years later, actually the official death toll is only the 59 people who immediately died of the radiation exposure or were incinerated by the, begin, the initial blast. Um, and that is all that has officially been admitted to. Um, there are high, highly varying, uh, not even statistics, uh, estimations of how many lives have been cut short by cancers and other kinds of maladies that were caused by, uh, by nuclear pollution, both in the region and across the world. Uh, and it's not possible for me to give anything but hearsay and, and wildly varying estimates. But a lot of specialists don't believe that the effects were as catastrophic as people originally thought as far as concerns worldwide. However, there was one um, effect that was immediately obviously connected with Chernobyl, and that is that the people around the area and in areas that were heavily contaminated didn't take precautions like taking iodine pills that pack your thyroid gland with iodine so the radioactive iodine 131 cannot get in to your thyroid. They came down with thyroid cancers, and this is very prevalent in the area that's contaminated by Chernobyl. And in places in southern Belarus and also northern Ukraine, the incidence of thyroid cancer in children is 50 times above normal. There has also been all sorts of deformities in, um, in the uh, species that were exposed to this radiation. There are many, many pictures, I won't show you very many of them, of, 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 of very strong uh, deformities that were caused by cesium-137 uh, is believed that these were caused by um, in the re region of Chernobyl. And there are also human uh, casualties, human deformities, and many, many types um, that, uh, that were similar to what was uh, uh, experienced in the animal population. And no study, t statistical study, has been done on, um, on the human uh, populations and on the effect on the next generations in this area. The Soviet Union had to blame somebody for this. Um, one of the key elements of the catastrophe was the secrecy that enveloped everything in the country. And even people in the nuclear um, agencies, even people in the nuclear control room at Chernobyl, 
did not realize the dangers of those graphite tips. They themselves did not even understand the dangers of the equipment that they were using. The Soviet Union did not admit this to the West or to the outside. What they did focus on was the error and mistakes and cover-ups that were done leading up to the disaster and immediately after by key people who happened to not die of radiation poisoning. Formin uh, actually escaped town with his family and did not get radiation sickness. Um, he was uh, accused of negligence. Uh, Dyatlov, who was in the control room when the blast occurred and received five lifetimes worth of radiation, almost a lethal dose, was not killed by it. And he also was sentenced with Formin and Brykhanov to 10 years hard labor. Um, Foman went insane. Uh, Dyatlov actually survived long enough to be pardoned after the Soviet Union collapsed, and he died of a heart attack in 1995. Valery Legasov, who's in many ways the he one of the heroes, who, who realized the catastrophe, who took measures sometimes with a lot of human sacrifice, but often with volunteer human sacrifice, not necessarily always to contain what could have been a greater accident, he was tasked with, uh, to explain to the United Nations and to a commission in Vienna what had happened. And he was only able, only allowed to tell half of the story, the story of human error, of individuals who didn't live up to what they were supposed to do, but he didn't tell the other half. And that haunted him. Two years after Chernobyl, he committed suicide. But. Chernobyl had a very big effect on the, on the politics of the country because the people in the Soviet Union who wanted more openness, who didn't like the secrecy, who thought it produced stagnation, they, uh, including Gorbachev, got the upper hand because the hardliners lost their nerve. They lost their nerve uh, to continue with this type of system. And Gorbachev's program of glasnost gains great momentum. Most people don't realize that glasnost was not something invented by Gorbachev. It was invented by the czars after the defeat in the Crimean War in the 1860s to liberalize the politics of the country then. And the uh, czars did that because they wanted to maintain power. For them, it succeeded for a while. Gorbachev did the same thing for the same reasons. Um, and uh, it, uh, it, he became wildly popular in the West um, uh, as a result of that. And he had sincere um, uh, desires to help and improve and change the country and prevent these types of things from happening again. Um, but the tug of war that continued to exist between hardliners and, and more liberal reformers continued to escalate and damage the economy as well as Chernobyl was an enormous burden economically on the Soviet Union huge amount of money. Uh, Gorbachev uh, estimated that it was about a, a, a quarter of a trillion uh, current U.S. dollars that would have been spent as a result of this catastrophe. Um, and this leads to a, a coup attempt to remove Gorbachev from power, to prevent him from doing any more liberal reforms. The coup attempt fails, and it is the end of the Soviet Union. The reformers entirely take over um, and even shove Gorbachev aside who's not reforming fast enough. This country dissolves into 15 independent countries. Um, many people in retrospect feel that the Chernobyl nuclear disaster and the political repercussions, many of which were psychological and others of which were economical, was one of the very big things that pushed the country to this uh, cascade of events that led to its collapse. Now, my story um, ended in a sense uh, on May the 3rd when I went back to being a graduate student and finishing less than a month um, at Moscow State University. Um, during this period of time, um, I uh, uh, decided that I did, had enough of radiation. I had enough of uh, Europe. Uh, we still didn't really know what was going on. I had planned to leave uh, uh, by train through Europe, but that was very close to zones that I believed were radioactive. Uh, and so I left uh, on the exact opposite way. I left on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and I wound up going in to Mongolia, China, and even to Tibet, where I got my first taste of altitude sickness. But that trip actually changed my life because it was uh, the first taste that I had of Inner and North Asia, and instead of becoming a specialist in the Caucasus region that I was thinking of doing, I actually wound up becoming a specialist in Inner and North Asia as I am today, and that was the beginning of it. Ukraine and Belarus are independent today. 
Uh, they are still dealing with the effects of Chernobyl. The governments of these countries had nothing to do with the government that was in charge during the disaster and the year, few years afterwards. Um, and uh, there um, is aging Chernobyl sarcophagus, a huge amount of money and effort and a dangerous work and ingenious calculation is going to be needed to continue to maintain this and to improve uh, the uh, security here. It has been estimated by some that a new Chernobyl sarcophagus that will have to be built elsewhere and transported on rails to this area is going to be necessary to, uh, to help with the long-term security of this still highly radioactive and dangerous um, uh, remnant of this nuclear disaster. <laughs>